and people are like arms around each other, like crying and laughing and all this stuff. And I'm kind of like, I got here four days ago. Like, (laughs) (laughs) I mean, welcome to Sincast presented by cinema sins. All right, everybody, welcome to the Sincast. This is Chris Atkinson from CinemaSins, joined by Barrett Scher from CinemaSins. Hello. Today we have two very special guests, uh, Magda, uh, Magda, and I'm going to get this wrong after yeah. I just said it. You got the first name right. Yes. Apinovich. Yes! <laughs> Yay! Yay! Manga Apinovich. There we go. Oh I won't have to God. say it again. Uh, <laughs> and uh, and Adrian McMorrin, who are both Yay! in a movie called Volition coming out July 10th. That is just two days away from this recording. Oh, man. Holy. Um, directed Quiet. by Tony Dean Smith, and I believe written with his brother. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah, that's right. Um, and, uh, it is, um, easily, you can describe this as a mind fuck, right? <laughs> yep. You can definitely describe it that way. That's mm-hmm. the best way to describe it. Right. It should be on the poster. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. They should do the, what they did in crazy people with the movie, the freak and, and put that little subtitle that says it'll scare the fuck out of you or whatever. <laughs> but, um, but no, our, little ch- our, our like cheery pep talk the whole time was, uh, volition, a journey to self-discovery. <laughs> nice but it was it was just to make each other laugh we would never actually put that on the poster <laughs> <laughs> i'm assuming this is a movie that we're gonna have to be very careful about we don't want to tell too much about it like his name is james yeah yeah we can we can maybe say that i don't know if that's on the down low or not but uh <laughs> Uh, but, uh, what we can say, I'm assuming, uh, from the trailer is that James is a guy who can kind of see things in the future, but it's not a perfect, uh, sort of ability. Uh, so he has to sort of navigate his way through life and he's kind of a, he's, he's on the, he's on the edge of uh, criminality and things like that. But, uh, how did you guys get involved with this movie? You want to go first, Mags? No, Aid, you go first. (laughs) You called me Aid. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell me when we first met? That's what people called you. No, I told you that my bandmates call me AIDS, which is super weird. Oh, what's, oh, oh there you go. I there like Nick Moron, so my favorite's Nick Moron. Yeah, yeah. There's a lot of good options to choose from. I think I called you a lot of names while we were working together. I I think I blocked that out, but probably yeah. Uh huh. You go first. Um, I forgot what the question was. Oh, how did I get involved? Um. Yeah. Oh well, uh, just like nepotism. I've I've known uh, the Smith. <laughs> I've known the Smith brothers nice. since high school. Uh, oh wow! Yeah, Tony was like the really cool guy, older kid, and Ryan was two years below me. Ryan and I were like on an improv team together. Weirdly, uh, side note: our improv team had eight members. Two of those members, one was Nathan Fielder, and one was Seth Rogen. Oh um, wow! Was- yeah. Wow. Really bizarre. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, so then, so Tony had been kicking the script idea around for a long time and it finally happened. Um, but uh, yeah, I think we'd been talking about it for like a decade or something. Yeah. Wow. And for me, I met uh, Tony when I was grad 17, 18 years old. I was in film school and he was in film school and we have auditions at the end of our year to to do short films and I wanted this part in Tony's film really badly and then I got it and I was so stoked and it turned out that he was a super amazing director like I don't remember a lot during that time in my life but I remember Tony being an amazing director he brought such warmth to the set that when he reached out to me a few years ago to to work with him and read the script I was like I'm in and then he was like, no, you got to read the script. I was like, I know, but I'm in. <laughs> <laughs> wow. So you guys were signed up even before you saw any script, right? Yeah, pretty much, right? Pretty even. much, yeah. I mean, I had seen really early versions of the script, and it kept changing, and it kept changing. But, um, but yeah, I was like – you would have done like, anything for those boys. I mean, you yeah. had done stuff with those boys. Yeah, yeah, like <laughs> okay, that sounds really wrong, like, like <laughs> just new movies, guys. <laughs> Inappropriate. 
<laughs> How did I really get the role? There you exactly. go. Exactly, casting Ooh. couch. <laughs> That's right. So he just sort of broadly sketched to you over the years what he thought this movie was, and then he just sort of uh, it, it evolved. Uh, basically, is that what you're saying? Yeah, um, I think he had the idea in film school. It, it stemmed from like a short film where. Tony says he used to be late all the time and he came up with this weird concept for a guy that like um, figures out how to like change time so that he can be on time. And so that sounds you like really he ridiculous. Late all the time? <laughs> late, late. Oh, that makes so much more sense. Okay. <laughs> what, you don't think Tony? Okay, never mind. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I was just like that's so like open about his life. Yeah, yeah. Well, he's not here. I can say whatever I want. There you go. Very true. Um. So yeah. So his that short film kind of ended up not really having a whole lot to do with the feature, but that's where it came from. And then we also did a a, a music video together. I'm a musician as well, and Tony made a music video for really me. Really talented like, musician. Thank oh, you. Really? Um, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> um. Yeah, we made. I actually, I think this is. I'm the most proud of this music video of all the ones I've done and Tony directed it. And so weirdly it wasn't, we, the, the Volition script was, I don't even know if it had been written at all yet, but if you go watch this video, it's called seven or eight days. Um, I'm in the video and I'm playing like a, a character oh, essentially. And, uh, and it's, ba I'm basically James in this video, like exact same look, exact same wardrobe. It's got a very similar gritty kind of psychological vibe to the video. And so that music video was also kind of like a, a short film precursor to the feature. Um, and sort of it's unintentionally. Really good. You should definitely watch it. Yeah. I did not run across that when I was, uh, going through you guys filmographies and everything. Uh, what is your band and all of that? I'll check it out. Yeah, so um, I do solo, like singer songwriter stuff under Adrian Glynn. And so that's what this song, G L Y N N. Um, mm -hmm. So that song I was mentioning, Seven or Eight Days. So that's an Adrian Glynn song. And then, okay. Uh, yeah, and I'm also part of a folk band called The Fugitives, who uh, we tour quite a lot. Uh, well, we used to, you know, before there was a pandemic. That's true. We just, <laughs> we just canceled our uh, our next Germany tour, which is such a bummer because it would be so nice to oh, go somewhere. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. I remember when I first started working with Adrian and I was like, I want to hear your music. And he would only give me one CD at a time. He wouldn't <laughs> let me have all of them. And I had to listen to all of it first. And then I'd be like, I listened to them. Oh, can I have the next one, please? <laughs> <laughs> but I have all, all Adrian Glenn's music in my car. He was like, no, yeah. I have to make sure that you understand the CD first before <laughs> yeah. I give you other ones. I'm actually glad that he did because I really <laughs> did digest it that way. And I listened to it a couple times over. And then when I was ready, I'd go to the next one <laughs> how do you uh how do you split up your musician career and your acting career because you've got you know a, a, a sizable uh and growing uh Whoa. list of of uh of credits here but it sounds like you're going on tour and stuff like that too so how do you balance that like what decisions you know i'd rather do this than that um how, how does that work how does that play out yeah, it's just a juggling act. My agent hates me, but he knew what he was getting into. Uh, like, yeah, I, I told him from day one, like, yeah, I also do all this stuff. So um, I, it just kind of works, I guess. Like, um, I try to make myself as available as I can. I, I also do theater. So, like, that's a whole other thing because theater, mm. you know, when you do a theater contract, like, you're doing eight shows a week for whatever, eight weeks or something, and you can't mm. you can't do anything what was, else. what was the one that I went to see you at that was so good? Oh, we did um, – I was in the production of Once. You guys know the musical Once? It's the – Oh, yeah. Based mm -hmm. on the, the Irish singer-songwriter film. Um, no, it wasn't that one. It was oh, based it off of the – Oh, the Leonard Legend. Cohen show. Yes. Oh, yeah. Okay, so that yeah, that's the beautiful. other one. beautiful. Yeah, we – there's a um, – yeah, there's a, a theater – show based on all Leonard Cohen music that uh, that was basically started here. I was in the original cast a few years ago. Really? Oh, really? What is it wow. called? It's called Chelsea Hotel. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, and I was, was actually really supposed good. to be doing that this past March, um, and and that got canceled uh, on first day of rehearsal. Like it got canceled. Um, so yeah, so there's, there's a lot of juggling, but you know, it kind of works itself out. I mean, um, so far there's only been minor conflicts. There's never been like Oh, I had a whole tour booked, and I had to cancel the whole thing to do a movie. It's it's all just kind of worked out so far. So, 
So, yeah. People make exceptions for Adrian because he's so amazing. So. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I'm They'll laughing, but you're right. Here. What's that? <laughs> I'm laughing, but you're right, especially in this movie. He uh, is. I, I'm like, I admire his work every time I watch it, and I've seen it a bunch of times. I still, I see something new in what he's done, and I think it's really beautiful. It really affects me. Well, you bring it in this movie. You also get your ass kicked in this movie. I mean... Like all different ways, you get your ass kicked. <laughs> mm-hmm. the, you, it, it seemed like it seems like a very physical part, right? Like you're, there's 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 stuff going on that facilitates you getting your ass kicked. I yeah, feel like I feel like yeah. you made it more physical. Mag Mag yeah. is like really really good at doing her own stunts and doing. She's done tons of fight work and uh, really. I, yeah, you, mm-hmm. you were showing me like videos on your phone of oh, like was, these I? crazy like fight routines that you'd been working on. And so <laughs> I I feel like there was like m- maybe the script said like, oh, there's a tussle and Mags was like, no, we need to do all this. It and was she's that like way. flipping over dudes. Like, it's crazy. <laughs> it was so true. I totally forgot about that. But yeah, I basically wanted it to be rougher and more big. And, and yeah, I was like, let's do this. Yeah. <laughs> Magda, have you ever thought about being a stunt coordinator? Yeah, I was just going to say when I was a teenager, when I was getting into acting, I was uh, actually really wanted to be a uh, stunt person. Mm-hmm. So it was between being an actor and going into stunts because I loved being physical. Mm-hmm. But uh, I fell in love with acting really quickly. So anytime I'm on any show, I'm always like, please put me in. I don't care if I get hit. I'm down. <laughs> I take bruises. I'll go. And I do, and I have, and I say I put my blood, sweat, and tear tears into this job, and I I do all of that. And I so love you're it. saying you actually got shot in this movie? <laughs> no, <laughs> but I do like throw myself backwards, and it was like a dangerous thing to go through. Like everyone was freaking out because you know I can't see behind me, and I can hit the railing with my head, and they trusted me to not die, so that was good. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Which one um, was that? Was that in the in the fight scene in the, in the alley? You know, with the no, 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 with the scissors and uh, oh yeah, 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 right. yeah, yeah. And so when I'm supposed to get shot back, like they they didn't even say that you had to go all the way down, but I thought that it looked more realistic if I push myself all the way back, right, all the way it does. Like, over the stairs. And oh such yeah! A layer of detail that yeah. I love. Now I'm going to have to go back and watch this movie just to see this again. Uh, this uh, this fallback and everything. Well, I definitely thought that I could sometimes, especially when people were freaking out, I thought I might hit my head, but I, I was pretty confident I could do it. <laughs> and it worked out. <laughs> or or did you hit your head and you've just forgotten? <laughs> <laughs> Probably because I forget words every day. So that makes yeah. sense. <laughs> it's the first song. Um Adrian, this had to have been a pretty tough, uh, without getting into uh, a lot of the plot of it, but this had to have been a pretty difficult uh, role to do because it requires you to, um, how do I say this? It requires present you to- different facets of the character. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah, you're right. It's hard to talk around, but it's, it's a confusing, uh, mind bendy. Oh no, we get to swear mind fuckery of a script. <laughs> um, and so I, Mags is probably so tired of hearing me talk about this, but I, no, I had I'm to, not. um, I invented this like really nerdy, uh, like table chart, um, just so that I would know exactly where I was when we were shooting. So it was, I literally created like a, a Google chart and it had like what scene it was, uh, what had just happened. Um, on, this is where states? it's really nerdy on a, on a scale of one to five. What was James's physical state? What was his mental state uh, mm-hmm. with like notes about like, you know, the things that had happened just so that, and because how it was so about confusing who in that scene at that point. It was yeah. Beautiful. Yeah. Like I'm not sick of hearing about it. Just so you know, I tell almost like every interview <laughs> about it. <laughs> Cause I'm so no, impressed by it. Right. You have to, because oh, it was so useful. The yeah. script is so tight and it really does you know dot all the i's and and cross all the t's but it but it has to adhere to a certain its own rules essentially right even even if those rules can be broken at at times again not with uh, getting into too much of this but i i totally understand you doing a nerdy chart like that yeah like if 
if you hadn't done that, I don't know what it would have ended up like because you did. It just was such a tight concept. And I felt like I always knew where you were. Like, yeah, I think if I hadn't done something like that, it, I think it would have just felt like more of a wash. And that's really what I didn't want. I didn't like yeah. James is in a, a in some kind of version of of distress for the almost the whole movie. Uh, and and I knew that if I, you know, especially since you always shoot out of sequence. Right. And so I knew if I didn't if I wasn't really detailed about it, then it would just feel like, oh, he's he's generally in distress and there wouldn't have felt like an arc. And, mm. and I, and that would have been really lame for a movie like that because, you know, it'd be really boring. Yeah. No, yeah. I, I, I'm gonna, for sure. You taught me something new and I love that. Like I, I will never forget that lesson from you, Adrian. Like, well, definitely I'm, I'm, I'm glad to stuff. share the nerdiness at all times. I'm a nerd and a dork, so please. That's true. That's there you true. Go. You are. I am glad to hear you say this because I was just sitting there going, how does he keep up? with all this stuff. How does he well, do Well, especially this? shooting out of sequence, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, I mean, you always shoot out of sequence. I don't think I've ever shot in sequence, but, nope. um, but especially, yeah. And again, without giving things away, uh, especially this movie, it's, it's so confusing. I mean, thank God, Tony, the director, he, his brain is crazy. Like you could not stump the guy. He always knew, um, and that maybe that doesn't sound very impressive. Like, oh, the director always knew what was going on. Big deal. That's his job. But like, he didn't even have to hesitate. And this is this movie so confusing. Um, and and sometimes I would be confused despite my table chart. I would sometimes be like, wait, but this and that. And he'd be like, yep, this is what's going on. And I'd be like, oh, okay, thanks. It's like, he, I, <laughs> but didn't I stump him at the the film festival? And I was asking him a question about a scene, and then it got really confusing and awkward. Oh, in front of the audience. <laughs> <laughs> oh did you i don't remember yeah no? you probably did maybe it's because yeah. he wasn't on set so he wasn't like he didn't have to be as on <laughs> it's probably that and it was just like uh these people don't want to hear my confusing i ramble a lot sorry go back to adrian <laughs> <laughs> uh did you ever have to correct each other on where you guys were though at the at any point or did or was tony just like yeah i know where you're at and then you had to you know, do you review your notes? Yeah, he always knew. He, as far as I remember, he was always right. Um, and <laughs> and like I usually had a pretty good idea because of my thing. But you know, I think there might have been a couple of small changes here and there, or or maybe we, I don't know, like just switch something, and so I just have to check. But yeah, he always knew. It was like, and he wasn't referencing some table chart. He just knew it in his head. It was crazy. Oh, oh my, my god! god. He now must that's... have been with it for a really long time. Is probably the <laughs> he probably read over this thing a hundred million. Oh times. god! Yeah, they rewrote it and rewrote it and rewrote it because it was such a hard concept to make just fly. Like they kept running into, um, you know, if one if they changed one small thing, then they would all of a sudden realize that it affected like 50 other things. And so they'd have to go address all of those things. Um, yeah. It's gotta be a nightmare. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the, uh, the, uh, you know, aside from the thing that we're not talking about and everything, but uh, the, I, I was instantly drawn into this movie because of the way James's ability was at the at the beginning because it it it's a it's sort of a he can sort of see the future but like it's not like what you see in most movies where there's clairvoyance and everything where somebody knows exactly what's going to happen it's it's more it's more he gets he gets images uh of what's going to happen and he doesn't know exactly what the context of those are yeah, it's one of those it's one of those fun aspects of this movie. And that's what you're that's what you're sort of, uh, you know, resting your whole uh, like uh, knowledge of the film on at this whole this, this whole point and everything until we we start seeing some explanations. But uh, uh, I don't know. I think there's a question in there, but I just thought that was cool is all I wanted to say. I think there is. I was just going to say that's one of the beautiful things I like because it's, you know, the antihero and um all all these superheroes with all these awesome powers and we kind of have been growing up with that like oh my god i want that but i love the idea the take on um it being an affliction and yeah uh more of a curse it's like well what if you did know some things about the future uh, you would get complacent you would get angry because nothing would change what's the point like i don't want to go out like 
I know this is going to happen. So there's no new surprises. Like, you know how, like, that person's going to be in bed or, like, <laughs> you know what I mean? How that date's going to go or how that conversation's going to go. And there's nothing interesting about that. And I could get, you know, yeah, you just lose the drive for life. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Especially since in the in the snippets he sees, which he's seen since he was a kid, um, he sees that he that he doesn't amount to much. That his life doesn't like look particularly great. So he it, it kind of kills his ambition and and like Mag said, it makes him complacent. And yeah, that's such a it's a much more interesting take than having like a superpower. It's it's um, uh, yeah, it's an affliction. It's so. I, I think that was one of the first things that I thought was really cool about the script. Yeah. What? So <laughs> let's let's get really deep here, man. Uh, what do you think about the movie's philosophy about free will? Oh man, I mean, I think that's something I, I still think about all the time. And and the best kind of the best kind of metaphor I have for it, for, for how I think about it, uh, which I've st- stolen from that. Um, Oh, this is nerdy, but from the Herman Hess uh, book, Siddhartha, I always mm-hmm. remembered he he talked about uh, life as like as a river, which I liked because it kind of encompasses both in a way. So a, a river has twists and turns. It, it has tangents. It goes in different. And, you, ha- you know, if you're going down that river, you have to choose, you know, which branch you go down. But ultimately, it all ends up at the same place. So. Maybe that's a cop out, but I I like this idea that we do have a lot of free will and a lot of choices, but but that there is a, a sort of larger overarching fate involved. If that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I love that explanation. I actually. kind of have a feeling like I like the idea of something there or fate or a destiny. I mean, that's the kind of stuff I watched growing up, and it would make me cry because I I want that more than anything. But I, I think there's, uh, I'm atheist. And so I actually, I don't know. I believe in nature, animals, energy, unity. And so it's, I shouldn't say that. Um, I just don't uh, believe in the typical spirit idea or whatever um, of the higher power, but um, like I have my own. And so I think it's like one of those books from childhood of like play your own ending or it's mm-hmm. like, maybe it all kind of ends to one of these three options, but you have all these other choices and ways that you can get to that. And all those different ways is where you're supposed to be present and enjoy that. Um, because as cheesy as it is, it's the journey, not the destination. I think we both said a similar thing, except my metaphor was a river and your metaphor was to choose your own adventure novel. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> and there was animals in there too. There was animals. <laughs> Um, this Which has a uh, this has a pretty small cast overall, but uh, one of the main uh, people you run into uh, in this, his name is Elliot in the movie. Bill Marchant, I believe, is his uh, is his name. Maybe Bill Marchant. I always said Marchant, but then I just saw an interview where Tony said um, Mar- Marchant, like sort of a less French version. Oh, uh, Marchant. Yeah, that's what I thought. But <laughs> hey, can you give him a call? <laughs> yeah, maybe that was him calling um, <laughs> that sounded like a landline by the way but that's, yeah, that's oh, that was, yeah that was my mom's phone sorry nice <laughs> um it was uh, et calling home guys <laughs> um I, I actually want to know what it's like uh what was like uh with all your your co-stars you have john cassini and frank cassini playing uh you know uh relatives who are uh you know uh, part of this uh I guess they want to sell diamonds. Um, and uh, and then there's a name that I do not know at all. Uh, Alex, Alex? Ponovic. Yeah. Ponovic? Hey, Ponovic. You, that was Ponovic. right. Okay. No, no, no. No, it's Ponovic, I think. No, I think he's his Ponovic. Oh. Okay, maybe I'm wrong. Let, let's have I'm a wrong. bit on it. I, Definitely I, call him. I yeah. always thought it was was, was Ponovic. Ad- Adrian, I'll have a yeah. bet with you uh, for an appy, Okay. Okay. Oh, nice. No beach. No beach. No beach. We'll hold the beach on the appy. Okay. Okay. So I, on, I'm going with Ponovic because I'm, I'm, I'm going pretty with sure. Okay. Okay. All right. Um, but how how is it like working with those guys? Because those guys all bring it uh, in their own ways too. Oh man, yeah. I mean, all those guys are like they're they're just some of the top actors in in Canada, really. Um, like like John is. 
he runs one of the best acting schools here in Vancouver and he's just like amazingly generous. I remember him being from early, like um, we had like early kind of almost brainstorming table reads um, to kind of talk about character and, and just to kind of deepen the character work and, and uh, John was so uh, like vocal in the best way. He had so many great ideas um, and, uh, and, and it was just awesome to work with. And Frank was awesome to work with. Um, Alex is amazing because he's done so much. He's also done a ton of fight stuff. And uh, and so, because, oh, I don't know if we mentioned this, but there were no stunt doubles at all on this movie. Really? Are you serious? Stuff. Yeah. Wow. Um, oh, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> and so right it was really right? Yeah, it was, it was great having people like Mags, like Alex, who have done a lot of fight stuff because they could just basically share their wisdom. And, you know, I've done a little bit, but nowhere mu- as much of, as those guys. And so I remember there was a scene where, where Alex and I are having like uh, like a fight and and he's sort of like holding me with a rake to my neck and I'm supposed to like knee him in the balls and he was I think we did a take and I came pretty close to the uh, to the goods <laughs> and he was like okay let me give you like a quick lesson in how to make it look like you knee someone in the balls <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. I don't know, Mags. What did you think? Who is your favorite other than me? Well, first obviously. of all, you didn't talk about what it was like to work with me. So thank you. Um, <laughs> well, you're right there. Um, and so I, I, it's also really cool with Bill. I, when I was in film school, that same film school, uh, Bill Marchant was the head, not mistress, what's the head? Yeah, he was the headmaster. <laughs> headmaster. <laughs> Whatever they're called, like the, the head of the school. <laughs> Masters. <laughs> um, he was uh, Snape, Professor Snape. No, he's actually uh. more like um, um, Dumbledore, absolutely. But yeah, he was um, he was very. He saw me at such a vulnerable, raw time in my life where I was a clusterfuck of a mess, and so um, it's pretty nice to work with him now. And I'm got some of my shit together, and I say some of my shit. Together. Some. Yeah. <laughs> Did you go from film school into acting school, or vice versa? I went from uh, acting to film school to acting. Oh, wow. Interesting. Yeah, because hmm. I was uh, 15 when I started, and then I started having panic attacks because I have extreme anxiety, and mm. so uh, auditions are really, 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 really difficult for me. Mm. And like when I'm on set, it's fine. It's just the auditions and I can't breathe. And I start to like gag and, and my throat goes numb and tight and, uh, they don't understand what's happening. And it's like, they just think it's an excuse and it's a physical reaction that happens. And so I remember falling apart in one of the auditions. I think it was, uh, Corinne and Heike maybe, uh, Mm -hmm. or Jennifer Page. Um, and they're like one of the main casting directors, um, here in Vancouver. And I just started crying in the middle of the audition. I was like, I can't do this anymore. And I think I, I need to stop acting. I think I was like 16 or 17. And they were like, no, we think you're really talented. Like, why don't you take like a year off, go to film school where you don't stop like learning, but you get to like kind of take a year off. And I was like, okay. And so I did that. Wow. It was good that you had somebody at the beginning who said, you know, we believe in you and everything instead of saying, well, that happens. And then just letting you walk (laughs) off. Totally. I'm very, very lucky for that moment. It was definitely yeah, a very special, lucky experience. Well, you, you I, obviously you came out the other side because you've got, a, a, again, quite the burgeoning career uh, and a lot of a lot of credits, a lot of different stuff. It, do you prefer like stretching yourself over these these different roles from being in in Green Inferno and and you and Volition and like all these these different uh, universes? Or would you would you rather have kind of a general lane uh, to no, 100%, to stick to? Since I was a kid, I, I loved uh, character acting, and I have this uh, face that doesn't really fit into any particular slot. Like I'm not the hot new chick or uh, the weird quirky best friend, or I, they <laughs> like even say that I'm not unattractive enough to play the um um character actors i'm not attractive enough to play the lead actors and so it's just um this is feedback that you actually get oh yeah throughout my whole life wow so you know when i get chances to be 
really different people. I feel very lucky because it's all I've ever wanted to do is just have, be able to amplify different facets of myself and um, just keep stretching and learning and growing as an artist. And yeah, so I, again, I do not discount how unbelievably lucky I have been so far in my life for everything I've had. I think like, I'll say that part, just part of what makes Mag such an amazing actor to work with and kind of going back to what she said about having these like anxiety episodes. And, and I think um, Mag's, I think that helped form um, the vulnerability you you present. I I was really struck by in all our scenes, um, Mag's is always incredibly present, which is like so valuable when you, you know, when you're trying to do a scene with, with another actor and, that they're not kind of doing things by rote or, or more mm. commonly in film and TV, as opposed to theater, film and TV actors, because the camera, you know, might be just on them. They will kind of be more internal and more focused on, you know, what their face is showing to camera rather than connecting with their fellow actor. Whereas Mags isn't like that at all. She's completely present and she will change on a dime depending on what you do or she'll make you offers. But I was just struck by, by the vulnerability that, um, I don't know whether to address you, Megs, or whether to talk in the third person. Um, <laughs> and so she, she was, she was so open, and that's such a generous thing to be as an actor. Um, both like off camera, I think that's why we. A lot of people have mentioned our chemistry, and I think a, a large mm-hmm. part of that is because. Um, I think I'm a bit more of a closed book as a person, but Max was a real open book as a person. And that I'm really thankful for because that allowed us to um, immediately have some rapport. And then, and then in the scenes, she's just so open with her, um, her, her, with her emotions and her presence. And it was just like, so exciting to, to be working on these scenes with her. So. And that's also why I love working with Adrian is like they, he does listen to, uh, the this the kind of things the offerings that an actor gives and you hit on a thing that's really special you don't get to have often is actors who are really listening to you and kind of adjusting to what you've given so there's always kind of a difference um and yeah and i i also think that it the reason you and I had such good chemistry because I like really went at you with hardcore sarcasm from the beginning of the first <laughs> that we met is that you have a really fantastic sense of humor. So even if you're a closed book, you still can laugh um, and like <laughs> it let that kind of uh, break your shell. Yeah. Muffled closed book laughter. Yeah. <laughs> but but you still laughed. It was good. You had a really good sense of humor. It's a big deal. It's a good thing. Oh. That was one of the things that I was sitting there like a lot of times when movies put two people together and they have to sort of have this love at first sight type of thing. It just never seems to work. It seems like the screenplay is it's they're doing it because the screenplay says uh, that, that they have person's to. person's famous and that person's famous. Let's put them together. Right, yeah. right, right. <laughs> and then and in this one, you know, you you know, like I'm I'm immediately bracing myself as like, oh, okay, this is. This is the this is the gal he falls in love with and 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 they're going to be like in love immediately and like you're just going to roll your eyes and everything but something about it works it it's the it's not only your chemistry but it's also the way the plot is sort of sort of set up it's it's set up to be that way but uh it is it's sort of a magic trick you guys pull off I am um, yeah and I think that's that's down to yeah to us just kind of really getting along right from the bat, but it's also down to the writing because, you know, we, the scene where they meet, we actually reshot it. Um, It, the original version was a lot lighter in tone um, and kind of uh, uh, certainly I remember Mags' character was a lot more flirtatious and, and kind of like, kind of like fun right off the bat, which just didn't, didn't kind of make sense with her character. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, and it didn't actually once they went to cut things together it didn't really fit the tone so we actually reshot that scene to um uh for for Angela to feel a little grittier which is kind of more her character throughout the film and and to not be as trusting of this like 
you know, weirdo in the in the alley and stuff. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I mean, also chemistry. I find that such an important thing. Like, I watch movies obviously on a daily and everything. Uh, I have no life. It's so sad. Um, no one does. No one does. Yeah. <laughs> no, no one does right now. But like, uh, I'm just talking about in general my 34 years of life. Um, I guess I didn't watch movies as a baby. Sorry, I digress. Um, <laughs> but with with chemistry, like that is such a crucial thing for me when I'm watching any movie. As soon as I start watching it, no matter how much I like an actor or both actors, as soon as I see that they don't have chemistry, I'm like. <laughs> it's just like what are you guys doing like it's and so it's to me it's always been such a fucking crucial thing when i meet my co-stars and i know that we are supposed to have any kind of undertone of romance or uh literal romance i make sure to take the time to try to get to know them and like be more honest and vulnerable and share more fast than you would typically to other people and Hmm. it's scary because you're putting yourself out there and you don't know what that person's like and they might reject you but the the times that it works out it really works out god that's so it's so fascinating because you know you think about all the different things that go into a performance the lines the the marks and and all that stuff uh the characterization but you touched on something about like you know being present with a scene partner Mm-hmm. And that helping to bring out, you know, different things. There's got to be, I, I, I won't ask for specific examples, but there's got to be some times where you've had to force it uh, because the other person is is not bringing the same energy. It, it, I have to Adrian, figure that's that's got to be right, right? I feel like yeah. you probably had a lot of experience with that. Um, yeah. <laughs> no, yeah. no, seriously, because I feel like I, we've talked about that before. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it happens it happens all the time. Um, and Especially in theater, too. Yeah, it happens oh, in really? theater, too. It, it, I think it happens less in theater because it's a lot more glaring <laughs> when, uh, yes. you know, when a live <laughs> audience is watching two people interact, uh, people can people can pick up who is But I just meant, like, in, in theater, if you're working in theater, don't you find the days that sometimes one of your co-stars is just so tired and you know that they're not pulling their weight the, nor- the way yeah. they normally do? Yeah, 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 yeah totally. Um, but then, yeah, what, what you get in film and in TV, like, you know, TV shows, like, sometimes, um, you know, the, the leads on TV shows have to work really, really hard, like, you know, regular, like, 14, 15-hour days, and... Mm. Um, and that's pretty pretty crazy and uh so sometimes they will you know they might not even be there <laughs> when when uh when you as the smaller part are doing your lines um mm. sure. someone will read them off camera um mm. or you like know when or some... i made that joke before adrian started about like or no you were here and that you like weren't there when i did my lines like that i've had that on set more than once multiple yeah. times in my life hmm. Yeah. Hmm. And so, you know, and, and there's also like different flaws. I remember reading years ago that um, there was some movie that Dustin Hoffman and Gene Hackman were in, I can't remember what it was, um, but they had totally different styles. Dustin Hoffman was the theater mm-hmm. in the moment guy. He like his performance would change take to take, depending on what was given. Whereas Gene Hackman was the style of he prepared what he wanted to do. He had a really good idea of how he wanted to say stuff and he's, you know, he's brilliant. So it was going to work, but there was very little wiggle room for how he would um, change it when the camera was on him. Mm -hmm. And so, and yet, you know, and yet obviously both those guys uh, come across like geniuses. They're both amazing. So, you know, uh, so it's hard to say what, what works better. I'd like to think that being a more present actor generally works better. Um, but on film TV, there's lots of ways to hide stuff. But it certainly is a lot more fun, and it feels a lot more like an art form when, mm-hmm. when everyone is in the moment and you're actually mm-hmm. like creating it, moments together. It's so amazing when I get to find actors who are like Adrian, who it is the ki- kind of almost uh, I take it as a theater Uh, performance like when you're on set like I immerse myself in that moment and I immerse myself with that person in that moment and I try to really be listening to it yeah it's I think that's why I love acting so much like I just I I 
almost it's like I'm more present than I ever am in my everyday life in a way. Mm. Um, mm. Which is not healthy, but. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but you don't just, have a camera on you at all but times. There's just something so unique and special with the art form of film and television when there's so many people trying to make you look good. The lighting, the hair, makeup crew, everyone's always hustling and bustling. There's like 50 people there and you too. And you have everyone has to be on their game and how this all comes together. And it's just when it does, it's it's kind of like lightning in a bottle, as they say. And yeah. I just I think more actors. Oh, my God, I'm going to be such an asshole. But I just think more <laughs> actors should be uh, very conscious of when they are having relations and scenes with others instead of, yeah, being like, I just want to get out of the scene and go back to my trailer. It's like, how about you just for a second be here with <laughs> mm-hmm. that person? I totally thing. agree. I am going yeah. to be looking for this from now on. I'm just, yeah. you know, um, I have uh, a few questions uh, about some other projects you guys have done. Uh, Magda, I'm very interested in that shoot for the green Inferno, uh, <laughs> whether that was the, like terrible or if it was awesome, it was the best thing you could ever hope for. <laughs> Nothing in between. <laughs> <laughs> there's there's, no, there's no such thing. There's it's no either such one thing. or ten. Yeah, exactly. But no, I, I just wondered what an Eli Roth set is like. It's pretty intense, that's for sure. It's um okay, so when I was auditioning, it was so funny to me because the casting director, so she's like, um, just so you know, like if you do get this part it would mean that you would have to travel to South America and work there. She's saying this as if she's giving me a pile of shit to eat. And I'm like, um, so first of all, you're telling me I, I would get to do the thing I love, which is acting. And B, I get to see a part of the world I never would have otherwise. Um, I think I'm good. I'll eat that pile of shit that you're offering. Thank you. Yes. It's like, I don't know who comes in that room and is like, um, oh, yeah, I don't know. I'll have to think about that one. Uh, but yeah, that's literally how they were saying it. So p- clearly, I think there was a lot of assholes who were just really ungrateful. Um mm-hmm. Sorry, I'm just such a jerk. I'm so judgmental. No, um, yeah. You didn't call anybody <laughs> out by name. No, I didn't. Uh, you didn't no, I'm kidding. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> he travels the world like crazy. Um, so, yeah, I, I thought it was the most incredible experience. I definitely came back with a bit of uh, PTSD. Mm-hmm. Um, it was an uh, intense experience to see such poverty um and on top of it I still felt so guilty because we're shooting a movie in front of all this poverty and yes we were helping them and feeding them and giving them more than they would typically ever see um Mm. but we definitely were experiencing it from a white person's perspective and wow so you had the ptsd not from the shoot or the content from the the reality of the environment yeah and going to like you know, this population, so we were in one of the towns and we were not allowed to uh, step off. Um, there's like a three foot um, cement leading from the hotel to where there's um, dirt and into the city because uh, they said you have to go with someone because if you're a woman or you're white that, that you could get kidnapped, raped or killed. Wow. <laughs> there was a child mm. like eating food out of the dumpster and uh, children that were naked on the streets. And it was just, it was really hard to watch and then just try to like still be engaged in doing a movie and then going to like Terrapoto. We drove to this port town and everyone was so happy, but had very little, they didn't have walls. And um, yeah, mm. we, we drove down the river for two hours to the last village in the end. And it was population 250 people, no running water, no electricity, you know, they Jeez. barely had clothes and these, you know, they had straw roofs and it just, it was, they were happy. It was just like, it still makes me want to cry thinking about it. Cause it's just so intensely different mm. than when you come back to Los Angeles and all of a sudden you're supposed to do pilot season and it's like, fuck. 
Oh yeah, yeah. 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 I can imagine. Real life. And, and wow. that's just that's some of the things that you you know I didn't even consider. I feel like an asshole now when I when you know watching that movie. I, such I, you an know, asshole. You, I know I am. I'm <laughs> such an asshole. I uh, no, I just uh, you know the the movie itself is such an extreme level of horror so that's what you're focused on for the most part you don't even think about well they shot this in this area and blah 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 i'm glad that you added that uh that uh, detail to it because uh yeah. it's something that i did not realize at all um yeah, it definitely as intense as the movie is that's as intense as my feeling was about where we were and what was happening every day oh wow um adrian uh i ran across that you were in the revenant um and uh that had to have been an amazing experience i know you conversely <laughs> what? from from temperature to geographics to everything i mean that's that's the polar opposite right yeah uh yeah well i wasn't there for i my part's really small i mean my part is like Im- important in terms of the plot cuz i i play the soldier from um dicaprio's character's past who like killed his family essentially um Mm -hmm. and he catches me in the act of like kind of starting to do that um and we shot a bunch of stuff that didn't make it into the film um so when yeah there's then there's not all it's sort of like not a ton of screen time for the role itself but Mm -hmm. um but yeah it was certainly a crazy set like that was mostly shot in alberta and bc um and so I've encountered a lot of people that like worked on, on the sets for the movie and um, everyone, th- no one has like a medium story about it. Everyone either, it was <laughs> the best experience of their life or it was the most traumatic experience. Ah, so that's like, the one or 10. Yeah, right? one or yeah. 10. Yeah. yeah. Right. <laughs> Very much one or 10. Yeah. Like, so I remember, so I came on to it really late. I think, cause I think, Alejandro and Yurido, he tends to write as he goes a little bit. Um, so they had already, by the time I got to set, they had already been shooting for something like, oh, I want to say six months. And, oh, geez. And it was supposed hmm. to have been like three months. Um, it <laughs> was like, it was starting to warm up because it was like March in Alberta. So it was, uh, it was still like cold, but it wasn't like, you know, crazy winter cold. Um, and I remember just getting you know to costume fittings and things and and the vibe of people was just you know the the sort of like 200 yard stare and and (laughs) just kind of they were just burnt out and and everyone would just kind of like shrug their answers and be like i don't know because things would 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 change like at the last minute things were constantly changing and people were being fired left and right and and i was like okay um and uh and i had my last day of shooting i was there for about a week and my last day was we were on this like open like alberta plane with the rocky mountains in the background and uh and there was this scene where my my soldier guy comes and uh lights this pawnee hut on fire and it's like this big wide shot and then they wanted to just like keep shooting stuff because as as the dusk was growing darker and the and the this thing was burning and it looked like really cool with the backdrop and so they just wanted to keep like just kind of riffing shooting stuff like um they had uh, the the kid playing to get Di- DiCaprio's son and then me with my torch and we just kind of kept shooting stuff um and and people were like it's not safe to let this thing keep burning but they're like oh no keep it going keep it going and then anyway finally finishes someone shouts out that's a wrap the crew starts like falling into each other's arms, weeping. Oh, oh um, my god! <laughs> like oh. I'm just like, what? Ha- what's happening? Um, they gather. Every- <laughs> the first AD gathers everybody in a massive circle because you know there's like huge crew. Right? It's like 80 people or something. Um, because everyone in this big circle, they they set up like a little PA system and they give Alejandro uh, a, a wireless mic and he proceeds to like give this speech saying that this had been, you know, the most significant artistic experience of his career. And thank you, everybody, for coming along for the ride. And, and people are like arms around each other, like crying and laughing and all this stuff. And I'm kind of like, I got here four days ago. Like, oh. yeah. <laughs> I mean... This would be a beautiful scene in a movie. Like, you know, yeah. just the way you set that up, 
everybody's yeah. just like it down in the dumps at six months of like you know they've they've been on a shoot that's like uh basically like apocalypse now or something like that it's and, like yeah. a war that you came four days before it ended you're like, oh, yeah <laughs> and then you come in and do your basic job and then yeah. like and, you know and then and they're like you know that's a wrap and everybody around you looks like it's the you know it's the most satisfying <laughs> thing ever and you're just kind of like all right well okay <laughs> on to the next project um seriously it was surreal yeah i would imagine so um so cool. <laughs> yeah yeah we would like to thank uh magda and adrian for showing up uh to uh, talk about this movie today volition it comes out july 10th um you guys probably are very proud of it it's very good yes. um and uh yes. and uh we we hope you uh hope uh some uh, tremendous success in the future as well. Do you have any other projects? Uh, I just put out a, an album called Ghost Light Sessions under my music name, Adrian Glynn. Um, mm-hmm. nice. And it's you're going to send on... that one to me, right? Yeah, I'll send it to you. It's only <laughs> on. Um, it's not on streaming platforms yet. It's only on Bandcamp, and it's download by donation with 25 percent of the proceeds going to the NAACP. Um, okay, now I'm gonna. So um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> but yeah you should get his music because it's fucking good okay um, right. my plug is i'm reading you're reading i'm just reading learning about myself well nice. that's good that's good there's, there's, you're reading a book about yourself <laughs> yeah it's called complex ptsd from surviving to thriving oh, okay. mm, i know this book yeah you read it yes well it's i've read parts of it it was a uh, i yes. yeah, definitely am reading it with a highlighter and a pen and i'm like fuck wow. <laughs> you are immersive my friend yes <laughs> um all right well we'd like to thank you guys for for talking to us so appreciate your time uh that'll do it for this interview it's chris atkinson and barrett share we'll see you next time thanks for listening comment on our episodes on our soundcloud page check us out on youtube twitter facebook and Reddit, and be sure to visit cinemasins.com. Quick uh, couple of technical things, because I've been threatened with castration if I keep Adrian on past too. I mean, you publicists, uh, you, you guys publicists are tough, man. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, mm-hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. I mean, um, it, when we uh, finish up and Chris does his sign off thing and everything, if you guys don't mind just doing nothing, uh, like Paul Rudd and in, in forgetting Sarah Marshall is do nothing. Um, <laughs> uh, where, uh, it, just so I can download your file real quick and then we'll, we'll sign off, you know, for reals for like in real life. silence. No, 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 uh, no, no, no. Just, just don't click out or close your browser or anything like that. Oh, okay, oh. okay. And I will download your files, and we will be good to go. I, it was like I was like actually wondering what you meant by that too. I was like, uh, I do, nothing, you, you, do nothing, freeze, do nothing, like we just... all freeze and just sit here in silence. I was just kind of confused. <laughs> oh my god, that's hilarious. It would be funny. It's that um, makes me think. That makes me think of this thing. I've been noticing that um, when people. Uh, have phone conversations in movies like watch for this they they almost never say bye yeah Um, yeah oh yeah and i've been like i've been noticing that for a few years and i just think it's really funny to to think about because also as a canadian like you know we have that whole reputation of being polite and so it's Mm -hmm. also funny to think about it through that vantage point and i brought it up to my my girlfriend who's a, a screenwriter and uh and she was like yeah, actually, they literally tell you in writing class, like, don't end phone conversations Wait, with bye because it's boring. Um, uh, and it, oh and it yeah, ruins the Wait, Adrian, stakes. you disappeared as soon as you said, you said to your girlfriend screenwriter. Oh, maybe I hit my mute button. Can you hear me now? Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah, I'm gonna hear oh, my you. God, I was hanging on every word. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Yeah. So, so she said that uh, in one of her classes, they literally said, like, yeah, don't end phone conversations with bye because it's boring and it, it kills the stakes and uh, yeah. yeah it's so funny that, can i just I, say one one thing to that because i see that with hey when people come into their room you never yeah. see that in the script and it's yeah, because it's yeah. boring but yeah, like boring. people always say hey how's it going it's not like yeah. you just jump into conversation um but i gotta say it's funny <laughs> my mom's polish and she like before you can even say bye or i love you she hangs up she doesn't even say anything <laughs> Oh, wow. so like as soon as she's done saying her point or what's ca- happening, she hangs up. 
That's awesome. Nice. It's nice. so funny. I'm like, <laughs> what? That's that's I baller. Mean, what's funny to me is is that it's not like it has to take any time on the movie itself for you to say bye <laughs> at all. I mean, like it could just be like you know, you know, all right, see you later, bye, and then just go on to the next scene. And you know, I I, I understand why they do it. I uh, they used to also do this thing, and uh, I saw this on the. Uh, I heard this on the commentary Alexander Payne did for election. He says, you notice that when someone hangs up the phone in my movie that you don't hear the dial tone afterwards, right. which is right. something they used to do all the time. It's like, I made sure that they didn't ha- that didn't happen in my movie and everything. It's really funny. Well, you don't hear the dial tone because they haven't hung up yet. You're the first one to hang up. Isn't that true though? I've never heard the dial tone when somebody hung up. Uh, it's, it's usually just silence. And then, oh, yeah, yeah, like and you then, have to hang up and and pick the phone up again to, right. to get mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah, interesting. 